Grizzlies came to Revelstoke to forage in the dump until the town finally surrounded it with an electric fence. And they come to town in the fall looking for apples. Late night party people sometimes bump into them, literally, after the bars close. And one Halloween, the trick-or-treaters had to stay home because there were so many bears in town. Bruce McClellan, a, a bear specialist for British Columbia Forestry, says that in the 10 years prior to 97, 120 problem grizzlies have been taken from town to be shot or relocated. 300 black bears have been killed in or near the town. That is the kind of human interference that raises holy hell with a grizzly bear population that fouls up home ranges and mating patterns and makes mothers desert makes mothers desert their cubs. Yet there has never been a mauling in Rubblestoke. I think we've just been really lucky so far, McClellan says. It's probably just a matter of time before it happens. Anne and Christine came to Rubblestoke knowing it was grizzly country. In fact, if there weren't so many bears there, Christine probably would have stayed home. The two women had been living as a lot of young British Columbians do, catching seasonal jobs, skiing in the winter, enjoying themselves all year. Anne was 28, tall and rangy. Christine, 25, stands only 5 feet 4 inches, but is athletic and strong. Both women liked working in the bush, doing outside work that built muscle and attitude. Christine does biological surveys, which means finding and counting animals. Anne cooks in backcountry work camps and lodges. Both had run into bears several times and neither had any special fear of them. The quest for work had brought them to Revelstoke and hoped to spend the winter cooking at the Durand Glacier Chalet, a backcountry lodge that craters that I'm sorry, that caters to skiers in an idyllic spot tucked between Revelstoke National Park and Glacier National Park. There are two ways to get there if you aren't paying if you aren't a paying customer. You can walk 14 kilometers or you can wait around for one of the infrequent helicopter flights and hope there will be enough room for you. A friend of Anne's had worked at the chalet the previous winter and advised her to walk to the job interview. It showed initiative and the owners liked that, Anne's friend said. <laughs> I can see where this is going. It made sense to Anne. Christine wasn't looking for work, but she tagged along for company. Oh, no. For exercise to see some new country. The trail doesn't get much use. It is prime grizzly habitat, and both women knew it is never a good idea to hike alone in grizzly country. It's not a good idea to hike in grizzly country. The morning of October 1st, 1994, broke chilly and damp. Driving east from Revelstoke on the Trans-Canada Highway, they found the Woolsey Creek turnoff where the dirt road hugs the east border of Revelstoke National Park. There's a lot of water in this country and not much flat ground, a combination that means steep canyons and rushing streams. Water so fresh off the glacier it's only a few degrees above slush. There was a highway crew working near the turnoff as Ann slowed her Ford Ranger pickup and headed up the old two-track mining and logging road. The kind of route where if you meet another vehicle, somebody has to back up, maybe for a long way. Carved along the waistline of a steep canyon wall, it climbs steadily through dense green forest. To the left, Woolsey Creek tumbles through the rocks of a couple hundred feet below. I'm sorry, Woolsey Creek rum, rum, tumbles through the rocks of a couple hundred feet below. On the right, mountains rise almost straight up. On rainy days like this, like this one, snow is high snow in the high country, no doubt, with real winter coming on soon, the mountains often draw the mist to to them like a soft shawl, tucking it in close around the collar and shoulders, tied up under the chin. Wolverines live in this cold wet in these cold wet canyons. So do cougars and lynx and grizzly bears. The forest is lush and verdant and thick. It's not very often that you can see very far. Sounds like British Columbia. At the end of the road, Anne backed the small pickup into the little parking area and the two women prepared to climb through the steady drizzle toward the clouds. They had backpacks, rain gear, some food. They planned to stay overnight at the chalet. It didn't take long before they found bear scat on the trail. 
they knew enough about they knew enough about bears to tell it was nutritionally poor that the bears were feeling the effects of all the small berry crop that of the small berry crop that year they kept walking making plenty of noise so they could alert any bears to their presence especially when they had to hopscotch across the noisy creek they didn't want any surprises signs of human traffic were few and they briefly lost the trail a couple of times about three hours into the hike after scampering up a small rock face steep and tricky but not a real challenge the women stopped at a ridge top they had just climbed out of the conifer forest and stood spellbound by what they found the habitat had changed entirely from pine and fir trees to dense brush and small deciduous trees each one sparkling with a different color and shining with wetness it was the kind of scene you expect in ontario not in british columbia christine remembers brilliant red leaves highlighting the rest of the colors they admired the view for a few minutes and then started walking down into the panorama that's when they saw the bears, a sow with two cubs just a few months old. The women felt no particular alarm. They had both seen lots of bears and these animals were 300 meters away. Anne saw them first. Look, she said, bears. At first, all we could see were brown dots, Christine recalls. A couple seconds later, we did a double take. Those brown dots were charging us. The woman yelled at the sow. They waved their arms and did everything they could to make her aware of them trying to make her realize they were human, that they were neither food nor enemy. She didn't flinch, nothing she, she didn't flinch, nothing. She stayed focused on us. And recalls as the bears came closer, Christine bolted momentarily and ran a few steps. Anne told her not to run and Christine slowed to a fast walk. By then, Anne was right. There were there with her. I'm sorry. Anne was. By then, Anne was right there with her, moving fast. This bear looked serious, and getting out of its way seemed like an excellent idea. There were no nearby trees big enough to climb, but the women wanted to get behind a small ridge, to at least be out of the bear's line of sight. Maybe that would make her stop. We dropped behind the little rise and couldn't see her anymore. And says neither of us really thought she was going to do anything but I thought I'd better get ready so I got my pepper spray out I turned a little bit I turned a little bit and her head popped her head popped up over the rise about 25 feet away so I just stood there with the safety off my bear spray ready knowing I had one good chance it's hard for me to read. I have different thoughts going on about it. it just, I can, I'll have to speak later on that. The bear charged fast, running over the rise that divided her from the women and lunging upward on its hind legs when it was about four feet away. That's when I sprayed her full face. The bear dropped to all fours and ran past her. Anne's immediate reaction was relief. The spray had worked, but then before a sigh could pass her lips, she turned and saw what the bear was doing to her friend. The bear just picked her up by the left elbow and started shaking her like a rag doll. I knew I had to do something. It was just total instinct. I ran over and sprayed the bear again while she was biting Christine. She was throwing me around like a, a dog would, Christine says. When Anne sprayed her, she threw me into a small tree. That was good for Christine, but not so good for Anne. With his face full of fiery red pepper, the bear turned again to Anne, grabbing her first by the right arm and biting down several times, her teeth reaching the bone but not breaking it. Shredding the flesh on biceps, triceps, and forearm. Oof. We were kind of wrestling on the ground. I was trying to get my arm out of her mouth, and I did, but she bit it again. Anne tried to pepper spray again. The can was empty, and she thought surely the jig was up. I thought I was going to die. Let me leave that there and we'll go to another video. Let you go, boss.